We will be presenting our work on machine learning approaches for pressure injury prediction. The work is a collaboration between Kensai and Smith and & Nephew. Hi, my name is Mohammad Aring Zubay Ahmed. I'm a research scientist at Kensai. I'll be presenting this work with my colleague, Barrett Larson, who will now introduce himself. Thanks, Mohammed. I'm Barrett Larson. I'm a practicing physician and assistant professor of anesthesiology at Stanford and also vice president of clinical education at Smith & Nephew. And we're very excited to share some work we've done related to pressure injury prediction. Ten years ago, if you would have told me I'd be here today presenting at the ICHI conference about pressure injury prevention and prediction, I really would not have believed it. Because ten years ago, I honestly didn't really know what a pressure injury was uh, until I, I saw one for the first time about halfway through medical school. And, you know, I was generally familiar with the terminology, pressure injury, bed sore, and so forth, but I didn't really know how bad this problem was until I saw a terrible stage four pressure injury for the first time. And it looked much like the image you see here, and it is, an image is hard to get out of, out of your mind. Um, these can be terribly devastating injuries, and they form when patients spend too much time in any given position. Now, generally, you know, most people, you know, when they're lying in bed, you're kind of, you're moving around, you're shifting your weight and so forth, and, and you're not spending too much time in any given position. But when patients are severely debilitated and, and they're sick or they're on, you know, on medications or in a coma, things like that, they don't respond necessarily to the, to the normal pressure cues that uh, you and I do. And uh, because of that, uh, they're at the, the mercy of their, of their nursing care and they need to be shifted and moved uh, manually uh, around the clock every few hours in order to prevent the breakdown of, of tissue. And if that doesn't happen, you can get a pressure ulcer. And initially these things just start off as, a, as an area of redness, but if they're not addressed and there continues to be uh, alterations in, in blood flow, these injuries can quickly evolve into, into full thickness wounds like the one you see here. And unfortunately, this is a, a relatively common problem in the, in the hospital setting. And you know, by some estimates, about one in, in 30 patients that walk into a hospital will end up developing a hospital-acquired pressure injury. Now, certainly, you know, not all of them, uh, very few of them are as bad as the one that I, I showed you previously. Uh, but nonetheless, even the, the more minor pressure injuries do have, have clinical consequence and consequences, and it's important to prevent them. And somewhat more alarmingly, de despite the, the high prevalence of this problem and the amount of attention that this problem gets within the, the healthcare system, this is a tenacious problem that is just continuing to get worse. And according to the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, which is a, a branch of the Department of Health and Human Services that's tasked with keeping tabs on, on national rates of, of these types of problems, um, over the last four or five years, this problem has actually gone up. Uh, it's, it's one of, it's actually the only hospital acquired complication that has gotten worse uh, over that time frame. And the irony is that we, we know how to prevent this problem from occurring. You know, it, while not every pressure injury is, is preventable, the vast majority of them are if proper preventative measures are applied. And these measures include things like making sure that the patient's on a, on a proper support surface, making sure that they're nutritionally optimized, uh, making sure that they're getting uh, turned and repositioned every several hours. You know, all, all of these things when applied properly can generally prevent a pressure injury from occurring. The problem is these preventative measures themselves are generally uh, you know, they're labor intensive, they're expensive. You, you can't necessarily apply that to every single patient that walks through the door. So what you need to do is, is risk stratify patients. And that is the cornerstone for pressure injury prevention. The problem is that our current tools for risk profiling and risk stratifying patients are, are pretty limited. There are a number of, of tools out there. In the United States, the most popular one is a tool called the Braden Scale. This was uh, developed uh, by Barbara Braden in the, in the 1980s, and it was originally developed as a tool to facilitate a research study that was done in a, a nursing home population. 
But over the last several decades, this tool has really taken on a life of its own, and it's, it's now being used well beyond its originally intended purpose. Um, it, was, it was never really intended for risk profiling in hospitalized patients or surgical patients or ICU patients, certainly. Um, but because it's, it's really you know, one of the only tools available, it's, it's what we're using today. Uh, the problem is it's got it's been shown to have poor reliability. Um, it's it's very subjective in nature. Uh, it also has a high inner rater variability. You know, so if you ask you know two or three um, nurses what a patient's Braden scale is, you'll probably get two or three different uh, answers, which uh, uh, can have uh, uh, implications on uh, the type of preventative measures that are subsequently applied. So. Um, you know, there's there's a I think a, a growing recognition in the in the healthcare industry that we need better tools, more objective tools, more reliable tools for risk profiling these patients. So with that, I'll hand things back over to Muhammad, who's going to do a deeper dive into the limitations of the Braden scale and explain how we've tried to apply a machine learning approach to this problem. A number of studies have been done on the predictive validity of the Braden scale. What these studies show is that the scale does have sufficiently high performance in terms of sensitivity and the AUC. Uh, however, with respect to precision, the performance is all over the place. What the meta-analysis of these studies show is that there are a number of limitations. For example, uh, almost all of these studies are in an ICU setting. And if you look at the algorithms and then the mix of the population, we do observe that the mix between the PI and the non-PI population is between 50% to 50%. While that is true for ICU settings, that's actually not true for most other real-world settings. The data set that we use for this study comes from the Center for Medicare and Medicare Services, or CMS. It's a U.S. federal database which is highly compliant and robust, a relatively large scale data set with greater than 40 million members per year, translating to 400 million data records or more than terabytes of data. It's also multi-setting, so we have inpatient data, outpatient data, nursing home data, so on and so forth, and it's longitudinal data spanning multiple years. The subset that we considered comprised of 27.5 million patients. Out of these, 8% had pressure injuries at various stages, as given in this table, translating into 2.2 million patients with pressure injuries. A filtering criteria that we applied was to focus on patients from certain facilities, and out of those, if you only look at patients who had any diagnosis as a pressure injury, then that translates roughly to 6.7% of the overall patients. And out of these, we can further break down the population in terms of patients who had pressure injury prior to their admission or present or on arrival POAs versus patients who developed pressure injury after they were admitted. So these are the cohort of interest or hospital acquired pressure injury cohort. If you look at the characteristics of patients with hospital acquired pressure injury versus others, what we observed is that there's much higher prevalence of previous instances of pressure injury, uh, higher prevalence of congestive heart failure, diabetes, so on and so forth. As expected, there's greater skew towards slightly older population in terms of prevalence of this condition, as well as greater prevalence in the male population. This is how we are setting up the problem. We are predicting at the time of admission, whether somebody is going to develop hospital-acquired pressure injury or not, predicting at the level of encounter, setting it up as a classification problem, so with positive class being that the patient does not have pressure injury at admission, but develop it afterwards, um, and using standard set of algorithms for validation. We now give a summary of results from our predictive models. Stratified baseline corresponds to a simple model which predicts at random based on relative percentage of the two classes. Logistic regression was the other baseline. Additionally, we tried multiple models like knife base, base net, SVMs, decision trees, random forest, and XGBoost. The best results were obtained from XGBoost and thus the results are given. And while the results from XGBoost are sufficiently good, we also wanted to check that in a real-world clinical setting, the clinician would want to have a, another model with a minimal set of features. The results for such a model, which comprises of only 34 features, is given below. We do see that there is a reduction in predictive performance, but the results are still sufficiently good 
to be useful in a real-world setting. The visual on this slide gives a summary of the set of features that we employed. In general, in terms of categories, these were demographics, labs, vitals, medications, and utilization-related features. The visual on the left gives a relative ordering of the most important set of features. In general, these factors are in line with what is known in the literature. For example, the most important feature seemed to be if the patient had previous pressure injury or not. In general, we also know that male are at greater risk. And additionally, many well-known comorbidities like congestive heart failure, hypertension, diabetes, so on and so forth, these are associated with pressure injury. With that, I will now hand over the discussion to my colleague, Barrett Larson, who will now talk about the real world scenarios in which such models may be used and what the future may hold for such models. Thanks, Mohammed. The results have certainly been very interesting and this has given us some insight into uh, specific factors that are driving risk. And more importantly, it's helped us understand how combinations of individual risk factors can compound a risk profile for an individual patient. And as you're seeing here, you can see how different combinations of very similar risk factors can dramatically alter the overall risk profile for a patient. So we believe that this general approach could potentially be implemented to more reliably and potentially automatically assess a patient's uh, risk profile, use that information to um, implement uh, personalized evidence-based prevention measures for that patient, and then have the risk profile and, and, and preventative measures uh, continuously adapt based on the changing clinical condition for a patient. So one way that this could potentially work is to have the machine learning algorithms fed directly from data available in the electronic medical record, looking at things like the comorbidities, demographics, lab values, uh, procedure history, things of that nature, and then um, computing in real time a risk assessment for that patient. And then just taking it a step further, perhaps the system could also potentially automatically recommend uh, specific preventative measures that are based on the computed risk profile for that patient. So in conclusion, the traditional methods for calculating risk for pressure injury are, are limited. They're, they're generic, subjective, uh, labor intensive. They've got a lot of inter rater variability, low reliability. Uh, they don't adapt to the clinical uh, circumstance for the patient. And uh, we believe that there's an opportunity to leverage machine learning uh, based techniques to significantly improve on our ability to compute risk. We can use these techniques to make the, the prediction more personalized, more objective, uh, automated, reduce the variability, make it more reliable, and then also have it uh, automatically adapt to, to care settings and in changing uh, clinical circumstances. So uh, we're very excited about uh, this approach and what the future opportunities are, and uh, we're happy to take questions.